Hey everyone, so following on from my 7900XTX review, I thought I'd make a little video covering how well this card overclocks and undervolts. This is the Asus Tough Gaming OC version of the card, and on paper it looks to be one of the highest end partner model cards released so far. And as I said in my review, this is my first AMD card in almost a decade, so I'm very excited to see how it performs and to learn how everything works. But first, this video was brought to you by VIP SCD Key. If you head over there using the link in my description box below, you'll find that they offer cheap OEM Windows 10 keys, for which you can use my discount code TPC, which gives you 25% off, bringing the price down to 16 US dollars. And once activated, you'll be able to upgrade to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Office 2019, which you'll be able to get for only 49 US dollars using the code TPC. So back to the video. So given my inexperience with overclocking AMD cards, this isn't going to be a guide and I'm not looking to break any records. My plan is simply to start by playing with a couple of settings individually and then see where the results take me from there. And after changing a setting, I'll use 3D Mark's Port Royal Benchmark to see how that affects performance. And I'll run it three times using the average of those scores, as running it three times consecutively will mean it's easier for me to detect when instability starts to creep in, versus just running it once and getting like a single successful result. I'm also going to be using this hallway and control to record the average clock frequency over 60 seconds. And with the card entirely stock on my 12900K, and DDR5 6000 CL40 base test bench, this gives me an average result of 15,529 and an average clock speed of 2,559 MHz. So that's the starting point. Leaving everything else stock for now, the first thing I want to play with is the power limit, and this ranges from minus 10% to plus 15%. And I tested with 5% increments, and here's a graph of my findings. So what I've learned here is that if you let the card have access to more power, it will say thank you very much for that extra power and use it all. <laughs> but just doing this on its own won't give you a meaningful performance increase, with the result between stock and plus 15% power only giving me a 2.96% performance increase in exchange for 55 more watts. Next, I wanted to play with undervolting on its own. My understanding is that this can make a huge difference to the performance of AMD cards, so I put the power limit back to stock for now and then lowered the voltage. I went with increments of 25 millivolts here, which is a little larger than you do for dialing in a final max overclock, but will enable me to be able to learn the characteristics of the card more quickly. It crashed on two of the three attempts on 1025 millivolts, but I've included the successful single result in orange. The difference here between stock and my 1050 millivolts result is 4.39%, which means on its own, undervolting did make a bigger difference than the power limit increase did. My guess would be that having the GPU use less voltage essentially gives it more headroom, both in terms of power and thermals, resulting in higher clock speeds. It's a little counterintuitive at first, but it makes sense when you think about it. The next thing I wanted to investigate was how combining both undervolting and increasing the power limit will affect the performance of the card. So this is the same graph again, but this time at the max power limit of plus 15%. From the get-go, even with the smallest increment of undervolting, I'm getting scores above 16,000, and I'm seeing no change in stability across my testing, with 1,025 millivolts still being unstable as expected. What is quite apparent here is that I'm now hitting a wall with the GPU frequency. So the next thing to play with is the max frequency slider. And I've noticed that sometimes the AMD Radeon software will change its mind on what the default setting here is, but it tends to be around 2900 MHz, which is close to the average frequency I'm seeing and explains the frequency wall. So I changed this number to 3000 MHz and ran through the same tests again. Here I saw no meaningful change on the 1125 millivolts undervolt, which shows that this wasn't hitting into the fault frequency limit as much as the more aggressive undervolts. And the rest of the results do show an increase in both score and clock speed from having extra frequency headroom. I'm hoping that the card has more to give, so next up is 3100 MHz, starting with 1100 millivolts this time. Strangely here, the average clock speed in control for the 1100 millivolts undervolt decreased a little. I did test this number twice and confirm this. To be fair though, all of these numbers are very close to each other and could be within margin of error, especially as my room has been varying in ambient temperature by a few degrees. So it's really just the overall trend of the data that I'm analysing here. 
Both the 1,075 and 1,050 millivolts results acted as expected though with a small bump to both score and clock speed. I haven't broken a 3 GHz average clock speed yet though, and each 100 MHz boost of frequency is resulting in less than the 100 MHz in average clock speeds, so I think I'm reaching the limits of what this GPU will do. So now it's time to try a 3,200 MHz max frequency, but this time starting with 1,075 millivolts undervolt. Ignoring the unstable 1,025 millivolts undervolt, the score in Port Royal has increased slightly, but I'm not seeing a significant increase in average clock speed and control. I think I've reached the limits of what adding max frequency can do for me with this card, but in the interest of being far out, I also tested 3,300 megahertz max frequency, and this resulted in artifacting and crashing, so my specific card can't get that high. It looks like the reports of 3.2 GHz to 3.7 GHz that I've been hearing have either been exaggerated or people have just gotten more lucky with their silicon than I have with mine. I do plan to dial in this GPU overclock more precisely, but for now it's time to divert my attention to the VRAM. For this, I put the GPU back to stock, but kept the plus 15% power limit, since I'll most likely be using this with my final overclocks anyway. For VRAM, there's two settings. The frequency, as you'd expect, but also an option to switch from default to fast timings. And because there's a chance that lower timings could result in more stability at higher memory clock speeds, I'm gonna test both. On my specific card, 2,900 MHz crashed instantly, 2,850 MHz flickers, and 2,826 MHz resulted in reduced performance, which makes 2,800 MHz as high as I can go. Going a step lower than 2,800 MHz reduced the performance, so there is no performance degradation here at 2800 MHz. But memory overclocking does make a significant difference to the performance of this card. And I found that there was no reason not to turn on fast timings. It resulted in a boost to the scores and no downsides that I've found so far. But it is possible that other cards will have issues with faster timings, even though mine doesn't, so your mileage may vary. So now that I know the VRAM overclocking potential, it's time to combine everything together and see how that performs. So it's plus 15% power limit, a 1050 millivolts undervolt. I'm going to try 3200 megahertz max and then 2800 megahertz VRAM of fast timings. Fingers crossed this will work. And it does. This resulted in an average Port Royal score of 17,607. Tuning from here, I tried 1040 millivolts, which increased the average score to 17,660, and then 1030 millivolts, which gave me 17,686. But knowing that 1025 millivolts isn't stable, I stopped there. I then tried a max frequency of 3250 MHz, but that wasn't stable, and neither was 3225 MHz. So this is my final benchmark stable overclock, and it resulted in an average Port Royal score of 17,686, which is a 13.89% performance increase over the stock clock score, which is actually quite impressive. And in the control corridor, you can see the difference between the card running stock and the card running with this overclock and undervolt. With the default settings, the card does get very loud when overclocked, but you can customise the fan speed and bring the noise down to normal levels. And sometimes lowering fan speed can actually free up some power limit for the GPU, but I saw no difference in performance here. So, a near 14% performance increase sounds great, but it's important to understand that these are just benchmark run stable settings, and that there's a giant difference between benchmark run stable and everyday gaming stable when it comes to overclocking and undervolting. And in my opinion, it can take days, if not weeks, to find an everyday gaming stable overclock. And even then, months later, a new game might come out and it could just hate your overclock and be unstable. My preferred method of finding the everyday stable overclock is to actually use the card for gaming, and then every time I run into an issue, to dial back the settings and see if that fixes it. So after a couple of days of gaming and dialing back my settings, the overclocks come from this to this. So I've needed to reduce the undervolt, lower the max frequency and pull back the memory overclock. And whilst these settings have been stable for me for many hours of gaming now, I could still end up needing to dial back the overclock further. But running Port Royal with these settings gives me an average score of 17,189, which is still a 10.7% performance increase over the stock score. One thing I also thought would be interesting to try out is AMD's auto overclocking features. The first one is auto undervolt GPU, and this gave me a result of 1,125 millivolts, an average score of 15,987. 
The next option is auto overclock GPU, and this gives me a result of 3007 megahertz, and averages a score of 16219, so this manages to do better than the auto undervolt score. And lastly, there's an auto overclock VRAM option, which gives me a result of 2648 MHz and average a score of 16,188. So I think something that I would do if I was looking for a shortcut to find some custom settings that had a fairly decent chance of running on my AMD card is I would make a note of all of these automatic results and then combine them into a single configuration with the power limit raised. So I tested just that and that gave me a result of 16,942. So this lazy method gets you most of the way there and takes no time at all to configure. It seems to be a very valid shortcut. So the last part of this video is to take my preliminary everyday stable overclock settings and to benchmark some games with it. First, I did Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 and the Tune 7900 XTX managed to beat the stock 4090 just as I expected it would be able to. We can see an 11% performance increase over the stock result. Next, I tested Horizon Zero Dawn and again, I saw an 11% performance increase. And finally, I tested Forza Horizon 5. Here, the overclocked and undervolted 7900 XDX only managed a 7% performance increase. But this game does seem to give the 7900 XTX some difficulty anyway, so perhaps this is one that will benefit from more mature drivers. So that brings me to the end of my initial overclocking journey with the Asus Tough 7900 XDX. I do have a few closing thoughts. Firstly, even though there are some bugs and some quirks, I have really enjoyed using AMD's Adrenaline software for tuning the card. At no point did I feel the need to use a third party tool like I do when overclocking on a video card. So AMD deserves some praise there. Whilst I don't think my particular GPU sample is winning any overclocking awards, I do get the impression that 7900 XTX has good potential for extra performance that you can unlock through tuning. And that's definitely worth exploring if you do pick one of these cards up yourself. I would definitely recommend that you get a card with three 8-pin power connectors though, and a beefy cooler like the Asus Tough. As I've not tried one personally, but it seems like the AMD reference cards run really warm, so a third party card seems to be the way to go. But finally, you have to remember that overclocking and undervolting is always going to be a game of luck. And I think you're going to be setting yourself up for disappointment if you think you're going to be able to buy one of these and immediately turn it into a 4090 killer. So you should always purchase cards based on how they perform out of the box and then just see overclocking as like a nice little bonus. So yeah, if you like this video, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and you want to see more of my videos. Thank you so much to my incredible patrons for keeping the channel going. And thank you all so much for watching. Goodbye.